Well, uh, Alec, thank you so much for helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. My name's Alexander Dunstan. I'm currently a sophomore in high school. Uh, there's not much to say about me. I mean, I'm just a really big fan of space. I've actually written a paper about the subject and I'm looking to publish it relatively soon. Um, could you tell me about how you got interested? Uh, do you remember uh, when you first thought, wow, I like space? Uh, well, I've actually been interested in space for most of my life, really. Um, and this is actually kind of funny, but one of the biggest reasons I have is because my family has been very involved with famous people. Um, one of them being Charlie Bolden, uh, one of the uh, former NASA administrators because he served with my dad in the Marine Corps. So I've known him and from that, I was so fascinated with NASA and then especially SpaceX actually. Uh, just watching SpaceX launches was such a big part of my younger years. That's uh, pretty awesome. I One time I went to the International Astronautical Congress in Guadalajara and I took a flight from uh, Houston to Guadalajara and, and Charlie Bolden was on that flight. So I was like, whoa, but that's as close as I got. <laughs> um, so tell me about your paper. Is there anything you can share or did you want to keep it a secret until you publish it? Oh, no, uh, I can share a little bit about it. So it's written for this class called AP Research, a class I'm taking. And in this class, we were tasked with creating a research question and answering said research question. I chose, does age affect somebody's in, uh, opinion on space? So I set out, I created a survey, I sent out the survey, got 246 respondents, and I had to write a paper from that. And once I submit it to, uh, to the college board, I'll get the opportunity to publish it. And I could uh, share a bit of the results for now. Uh, I ended up finding that the older somebody is, those people tend to have a more favorable opinion on space flight compared to the younger people who actually had a trend of being less favorable towards it, showing more negative responses to most of my questions. Uh, do you have an uh, idea on like where you start seeing the biggest change in that opinion? Like what's the age group? Uh, so the age group I found had the lowest response, uh, had the lowest response was my age group of 25 through 45, uh, compared to the age group that had the biggest, uh, most positive response being the 52 and up. And I can't exactly, in the paper, I can't answer why, because I never ended up asking why, but my personal opinion, it's because the way I chose the age groups, 25 through 45, happened to coincide with the space shuttle program. And 52 and up would have uh, coincided with basically the Apollo program. And my thinking being that uh, stuff like the Challenger Columbia events might have changed people's opinion if they grew up during the Apollo, uh, sorry, growing up during the shuttle era compared to those people growing up during the Apollo era. And I think that played a very big role. Um, so, did you do any study about the group um, that's like less than 25? Uh, yes, I did a uh, age group of 13 through 24. They were, um, they were about in the middle compared to those two groups. They weren't as positive as the 52 and up, but they weren't near as negative as the 13 through 24. Uh, do you think um, it has more to do with when they um, were born versus what part of their life they're in. Like uh, people who are between like 25 and 46 are very much focused on like job, bills, putting kids through school, you know, practical stuff. They're like, how can it help me? And then people who are like older than that, you know, they've already kind of lived their life and maybe they're nostalgic and thinking, I mean, I was wondering what you thought. Yeah, that is extremely possible. And if I'm being honest here, that's probably one of the best explanations for it. Just like I said, and I actually mentioned in my paper, but because I never ended up asking each respondent why they responded this way, can't really draw any conclusions from that, but I would be very interested in researching that in the future as well. 
Um, well, I kind of talking about your peers. Uh, do you find your peers are interested in space, the people you interact with, or, uh, or, or do you uniquely have this, this interest? Um, well, they don't have as much interest uh, anywhere near as me. However, a lot of them do humor me when I start talking with them about things going on in the space flight world. Uh, I know uh, one or two peers, though, that do actually share a in uh, vested interest with me. But yeah, uh, especially like my parents, though, I kind of drive them a bit mad, always being like, oh, hey, this launch is happening today. I need to go watch it. Yeah, I, I, I have people that humor me, too, <laughs> as I understand the, uh, the interaction. Um, but coming to the moon, uh, did you know that NASA's planning to send astronauts back to the moon for the first time since 1972? Yes, I am watching the Artemis program very, very closely. It has been very exciting to watch it. Uh, do you remember when and how you found out about it? I actually only found about Artemis probably very recently, about two or three years ago. Um, can't remember exactly when, but yeah, I ended up finding about it like two or three years ago. Uh, and it was just very interesting to find out about it because obviously I knew about the Apollo program and I was like, oh my God, so they actually have another moon program that they're doing and this is awesome. Um, I've been doing uh, this interview for like over 900 days. I started in 2019 doing one per day. My plan was to talk to people at like Starbucks at the mall on the street, you know, just random people go up to them. Hey, can I interview about us going back to the moon? And I found out that about 80% of people who aren't space people uh, don't know we're going to the moon. And I was wondering if based upon uh, maybe your interactions with your peers and others, uh, do, you, do you feel that that's probably about right? Or do you think that's, that's more than you would expect or less than you expect that 80% do not know? Um, I would, ex I would expect around that, if not maybe like closer to 90%, because from my interactions, I've found that a lot of people don't know about the program because I'll be talking to people and I'll mention the Artemis program and they'll be like, Ooh, what's that? And I'm like, Oh yeah, it's NASA's new moon program. And they just don't know about that. And I, to be honest here, I'm just slightly disappointed in that fact. I feel like it would do a lot more for more pe for the general public to know more about this. Yeah, it's uh, one of the reasons we're going back is to inspire people uh, about what humanity can do, about what the United States can do to go and study, you know, science and engineering, math, and those types of fields. Uh, of course, one would wonder how inspirational something could be if it's not known. You know, like there seems to. <laughs> But uh, what do you think about us going back to the moon? Oh, I think it's great. I think it needs to have happened. It's just so sad that the Apollo program ended where it did. It is very nice to see us going back and hopefully going back for uh, permanently this time. I feel like it's very important to have a permanent moon base set up before even looking at places like Mars, which don't get me wrong, Mars is cool and all, but the moon is the closer place and a colony on the moon would serve us better. Yeah, you know, I, I keep thinking yeah, Apollo 8 was like the first time we went ar around the moon and saw the earth from the moon. And it seemed to me that the astronauts were probably more amazed at seeing the earth than the moon at that point, you know, just like a little bitty small sphere, like, oh my gosh, that's where we live, you know? <laughs> And you know, these people going to Mars, they're going to see something completely different. They're going to see the Earth disappear. I mean, what does that do to a human? Oh, I don't know. Seeing the one place you know home just vanish from your sight for good. <laughs> that would probably be a pretty changing experience because, I mean, that experience you described of seeing how small the Earth really is, according to a lot of astronauts, uh, according to a lot of Paul astronauts, was really a changing experience for them even going up on the International Space Station. Yeah, I just, just understanding our place in the universe is 
like the universe is a huge place. <laughs> you know, we're like itsy bitsy micro dot on a dot on a dot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so whenever you think about humanity and where we might get to in two hundred years, especially in relation to space travel, um, what is? I mean, in two hundred years, how far do you think we could get? Okay, so. 200 years, I think we're definitely looking at full-blown Mars and Moon colonies. I think we will have gotten to that point in 200 years. We may have approached some colonies in the outer reaches of the solar system. I definitely think we will have done all the research we can into the more far out there colonies. We could look at places like Titan, Venus, things like that. Colonies developing there purely depends on whether or not we figure out if those places are actually good sites for colonies. In terms of anything else, I think the biggest issue is trying to figure out if in 200 years we make a miracle discovery and discover something uh, that revolutionizes space travel. Because 200 years, if we're still going on basically the same, basically the same uh, space light hardware, except maybe something like nuclear engines that's something i definitely see coming back in 200 years no matter what i feel like we won't end up going beyond the solar system with just that to go beyond the solar system we'd probably be looking at like i said a miracle discovery of something along the lines of faster than light or uh, near light travel that would be uh awesome to think that in yeah. 200 years we might have colonies throughout the solar system and and maybe even our first mission on the way at least to another star um if it was safe and affordable would you take a trip to space oh absolutely i would how, how far would you consider going as far as i can would you uh, immigrate to mars um maybe maybe i mean I would, I don't know about living there, but certainly going there, that would be the amazing experience, I think. I, I would have to consider if whether or not I'd live there, because um, that trip time, I, I would have to, I'd have to make my choice wisely. Yeah, I definitely would need to bring some entertainment. Yep. I, so I'd like to take that uh, 200 question question and uh, switch it around a bit. Um, so let's say you or one of your descendants actually migrates to Mars and it's 200 years in the future and you're a great, 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 great. I'm not sure how many greats it takes to get to 200 years, but whatever. Uh, granddaughter is on Mars in high school. She's a sophomore in high school, just like you. And she's doing a research paper on the 2020s. What do you hope she can write in her research paper about this period of time that we're currently living in? This period of time? So what I hope, at least like you said, in the 2020s, I hope we can write that the Artemis program, if, if it's successful in its goal of getting to the moon, and probably for me, the biggest one would be whether or not Starship uh, succeeds. That is quite simply the biggest one for me, because I think that if Starship succeeds, we can get that Mars colony easily within 200 years. It's just such a revolutionary piece of technology that if it doesn't succeed. I just, I don't know what we're gonna do. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think of it as Thomas Edison and a light bulb, you know? You, you keep trying until you get a light bulb, you know? So, yep. so, but yeah, no, I think Starship would, Starship are a vehicle that does the same thing of being 100% reusable, flying multiple times per day. I mean, it would revolutionize our access to space for sure. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being honest here, I think we need, even with Starship development, we need more vehicles like Starship. This, can, this simply can't be done by just one company, one vehicle. We need more because more is better. So it's just, I'm hoping hoping places like Blue Origin uh, can kick things in the gear, really, 
uh, with their new Glenn rocket, for example. I know they've investigated doing a fully reusable second stage as well, Project Jarvis. But from what we've seen, that's kind of that's kind of mired in development hell. I don't know if Rocket Lab would ever be interested in building anything as large as Starship, but them building a fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicle because neutrons in development, and that's almost fully reusable. The second, uh, it's partially reusable. The second stage is ditched, but things like that. It is, it is crazy to see how much SpaceX has revolutionized to the industry with these companies focusing from the get-go on reuse. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also amazing how like the entrenched players seem to still be uh, not focused on reuse. It's just like, <laughs> it's just like looking at the railroad company saying, don't you think you should at least look at the airplane? <laughs> yeah. Um, so not to slight Tony Bruno here, but uh, so I don't dislike him, but um, he did make one comment one time that SpaceX was only economical if they reused the Falcon 9 10 times. And everybody was like, what? It, but it only takes like three or four times for them to be economical. And even now, they're, they have, I believe, three boosters that are over 10 flights at this point, and one booster's on its 12th flight. So it's like, at this point in time, they've already achieved the reusability goals of being economical by his standards, of course. But it's like SpaceX would not be pursuing this if this was not the most economical option compared to full stop expendable. And even uh, United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur, I'm very disappointed that that's not reusable. It's using something called smart reusability. So the engine block is recovered. But even then, I just don't feel like that's enough. And they've talked about it, but my understanding is like the initial version is actually not going to have even smart reuse. Yes, exactly. It's like it's kind of a, a thing they may or may not add on in the future to Vulcan. They have like they have not full stop said, oh yeah, we're using smart reuse on Vulcan in the future. They just like, yeah, we might do it. It, yeah, it, and you know, a place where it's smart reuse, I think we should also look at is on the uh, SLS as well. I mean, uh, the, those rocket engines are very expensive on the SLS. Uh, yeah, uh, I have my own uh, issues with SLS's total price. Yeah, it's way too high. Yeah. Uh, we got a... And uh, also the flight rate uh, is kind of interesting, you know, I mean, uh, it not only do you get more uh, flights out of the same cost from your ground equipment, but also in terms of keeping the skills of your people up to date, uh, you know, around your uh, flight controllers and uh, everything else, um, you know, if it just seems to me flying multiple times per year would be better than flying one time per year, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's also another one of my biggest issues, the uh, flight cadence. And the strange thing is the flight cadence is restricted by the build speed. For some reason, they can only manufacture one SLS per year. And to be honest here, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That I just don't know what about SLS is giving Boeing such a hard time besides, you know, maybe them just not caring enough. It's just doesn't and especially like the development costs of SLS are we're just so astronomically high compared to what we got. And those poor RS 25s, man, they flew on a reusable vehicle and now they get ditched into the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something else. It, it takes a lot to, to think about and absorb, but you're 100% right, I think. Well, um, Alexander, I know we talked about quite a few things. Um, those are the questions I had planned, but is there anything that you wanted to talk about or did you have any questions? Uh, no, for the most part, I think I'm satisfied with what I've talked about so far. Well, it was such a pleasure to get to meet you and uh, your research paper uh, sounds really amazing. Um, you know, getting 
a wide range of, of people and kind of figuring out what their views are. Um, yeah, so I, I hope you get top marks on it. Thank you. Well, you have a good rest of your day and um, hope we cross paths at some point. Yep, you too, Nathan. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.